Good evening, everyone. Welcome. Um, I'm so glad to uh, see you here this evening for the second of our two Constitution Day presentations. Constitution Day is actually tomorrow, September 17th, but we're holding programs today to accommodate both class and speaker schedules. Constitution Day is a federal holiday that commemorates the signing of the U.S. Constitution on September 17, 1787. If you have questions for our current speaker, we ask that you type them in the Q&A box, which is right next to the chat box. After the main presentation, I'll moderate a Q&A with our speaker. Today's program is being recorded and it will be posted on the Law School's YouTube channel in a few days. As a reminder, we hope that you will take all necessary steps to have your vote count in November. We're going to post some links um, that you'll you see here on this slide into the chat after the, the program begins. I'm very excited to introduce our speaker, L. Song Richardson, who is the Dean and Chancellor's Professor of Law at the University of California at Irvine School of Law. She also holds joint appointments in the Department of Criminology, Law and Society and in the Department of Asian American Studies. She received her undergraduate degree from Harvard and her JD from Yale Law School. Her legal career has included partnership at a boutique criminal law firm and work as a state and a federal public defender. She was also an assistant counsel at the NAACP Legal Defense and Education Fund. Immediately after law school, Dean Richardson was a Skadden Arps Public Interest Fellow with the National Immigration Law Center in Los Angeles and the Legal Aid Society's Immigration Unit in Brooklyn, New York. She's a leading expert on implicit racial and gender bias in a variety of contexts, including emerging technologies. And I am very lucky because I get to serve with her on the executive committee of the Association of American Law Schools. We're thrilled that she's with us this evening to talk about a very timely talk, topic. Dean Richardson, welcome. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Dean Dickerson, and it's such a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me. Um, and all of you at the law school, you're so lucky uh, to have Dean Dickerson as your dean, but I'm sure you already know that. Um, it is such a pleasure to be here today to uh, speak with all of you on the day before Constitution Day. And as Dean Dickerson said, um, today I want to focus on the ep epidemic, I would call it an epidemic, of racial violence that's taking place across the country. And the continued and relentless killings of young Black men and women at the hands of the police are disturbing, but unfortunately, unsurprising. So according to a recent FBI report, white officers, white police officers, kill young black men under the age of 20 on an average of twice a week. Now, of course, these killings occur in the shadow of our nation's sordid racial history, and they're part and parcel of a criminal justice system that continues to reflect and reproduce race subordination. What I want to focus on today, though, is the typical way that racial violence is discussed. So typically the conversation follows two familiar paths. On the one hand, racial disparities in uh, violence, in police violence, people say exist because officers are racist. And of course, some officers are. And the other explanation that's often given for racial disparities in police violence is that the police were justified in using force because they were responding to a legitimate threat. The problem with this dominant framing is that it masks an even more serious problem. And that problem is that we should expect to see racialized police violence, even in the absence of conscious bigotry or even in the absence of legitimately threatening conduct. And that's because of what I'll refer to today as suspicion cascades. So what do I mean by that phrase? I use that phrase, suspicion cascades, to reference how waves of systematic and predictable, so systematic and predictable decision-making errors can cause significant racial disparities in police uses of force, even in the absence 
of racist officers on the one hand and individuals engaged in threatening conduct on the other. And when these decision-making errors are combined with policing strategies and Fourth Amendment doctrine, I argue that racial violence is predictable. So I'll talk about the three psychological processes that make up my theory of suspicion cascades, and they are stereotype threat, masculinity threat, and implicit racial bias. So I'll discuss all three next, but I want to highlight one important point now, and I'll return to it at the end. And when I discuss these psychological processes, it's um, easy to then assume that the issues I'll be talking about are individual because these psychological processes affect us as individuals. But they really represent systemic racism and white supremacy. And I'll explain more about that at the end of my talk, but I wanted to highlight those two things now. Okay, so what is stereotype threat? Some of you uh, may be familiar with that because there's lots of studies involving stereotype threat in the edu educational context, specifically related to standardized testing. Uh, but stereotype threat refers to the fear of confirming or being evaluated in terms of a negative stereotype about a group that you belong to. So again, stereotype threat, it's that fear that you will confirm or be evaluated in terms of a negative stereotype about a group to which you belong. So for instance, I'm female and I might be concerned that if I perform badly on a math test, people may suspect that I've done poorly because I'm female. And that's because of the stereotype, right? That, that females are not good at math. And so this anxiety that I'm worried that I might do badly on this math test and I care a lot about doing well on a math test, this anxiety, it leads to physical and mental reactions that are difficult, if not impossible to volitionally control. And these are physical and mental reactions like increased heart rate, fidgeting, sweating, uh, being unable to think clearly or speak clearly. So just think about the, the uncontrollable mental and physical reactions you have when you're nervous. Now, problematically, these reactions to stereotype threat that I've just discussed, they can often lead to the very behaviors or results that you sought to avoid in the first place. So going back to the example I gave, if I'm about to take a difficult math test and I care about how well I do, but I'm concerned that if I do badly, people will attribute it to the fact that I'm female, what it does is it divides up my attention now, right? So part of my attention is, is trying to work with my anxiety, my stereotype threat, and the other is focused on this very difficult math test. And because my attention is divided, I'm not gonna do as well as I could have. So that's often how stereotype threat works. And the influence of stereotype threat has been shown in a wide variety of settings, um, and it can affect anyone. So it can influence you regardless of what group you belong to, as long as you're concerned that there's a negative stereotype about your group that happens to be salient in a particular situation. Um, one thing that's important about stereotype threat is you don't have to endorse the negative stereotype about your group in, in order to be affected by it. In fact, researchers conclude that stereotype threat is more likely to affect those who don't fit the stereotype because that's what increases anxiety. All right, so why am I talking about stereotype threat? Because there's some research that exists that studies the impact of stereotype threat on the police. So if you think for a moment about what stereotype, what negative stereotype might police be worried about? Well, what this research demonstrates, and it won't be surprising to you, is that one of the negative stereotypes that police are worried about confirming is that they're racist, even if they aren't consciously bigoted, right? They are worried that they will be believed to be racist. And so the researchers wanted to test the effects of stereotype threat on the police. And the way they did that is they had officers participate in a virtual 3D simulation of an interaction with a citizen. I'm not sure if any of you have ever seen this. It's, it's pretty incredible. You walk into a room, there are screens on three sides of you um, from floor to ceiling. And it, it 
it exhibits uh, a suspect who is interacting with the officer in real time. And police departments use this type of technology to train their officers. So in this particular research, the officers were interacting with a suspect on the screen, as I mentioned, in real time. And the officers were armed with laser guns that are similar to the nine millimeters that they carry on patrol. So in the scenarios on these screens, uh, the suspect is acting in potentially threatening ways, such as by waving a stick or reaching into his pockets. And the officers are told to react as if they're dealing with a live suspect. And then the scenario ends when the officer either gains control of the suspect and arrests him or shoots him. And within the scenarios, the researchers manipulated the suspect's race. So the suspect was always male and he was either white, black, or Latinx. So what did the results show? And these results are going to be counterintuitive. So disturbingly, what the researchers found was that officers who were high in stereotype threat, in other words, officers who were highly concerned with appearing racist, even if they weren't, and there was testing done to determine whether they were consciously racist or not. So officers who were highly concerned with appearing racist, those officers ended up shooting black suspects more often than suspects of other races. And I just want to very quickly share my screen just so you can see this on a, on a graph. Okay, so this graph right here just shows the results from one of the studies. So when an officer was low in stereotype threat versus when an officer was high in stereotype threat, very concerned with being judged to be racist and low, not concerned at all. And as you can see, when an officer was highly concerned with being viewed as racist, he ended up shooting black suspects far more often than the officer who was low in stereotype threat, who was not concerned. Um, what was interesting about this uh, study, because I was able to see some videos um, of some of these uh, experiments, and there was an officer who, whose video I was able to see, and this was an officer who was so proud of his racism. This is an officer who talked to the black researchers, um, saying negative things about black people, racist things about black people. So he participated in, in, in one of these um, uh, scenarios. And then there was a video of the officer that I always think about, the, the feminist officer, right? The, the one who cares so much about rights, who's trying to do everything right. So they had the video of the racist officer and the, I'll call him the, the feminist officer. And it was amazing because the feminist officer from the very beginning of that video, and this was one with a black suspect, he was on edge, he was very, you, you could tell he was very um, anxious, right? Very anxious during this video, reacting um, not, with, without thinking that much and yelling and screaming from the beginning uh, with the suspect and pulled his gun out, I'd say within less than five seconds. And he had shot the suspect dead in less than 15 seconds. And this is the like egalitarian officer. And then I saw the video of the complete bigot, proud of his bigotry. And in that video, his whole demeanor was relaxed. His whole demeanor was sort of like this, just put the stick down, sir. Sir, I know you're upset, but we can talk about it later, sir. Just drop the stick. Like that was his demeanor. He never pulled his gun and he arrested the suspect without shooting him. Uh, and again, that was the racist officer, right? And so again, these, these results were counterintuitive and it was so powerful to actually see that video. All right, so as I mentioned, officers high in stereotype threat, very concerned with being seen as racist, ended up shooting black suspects more often than suspects low in stereotype threat. But this research went even further because what the researchers did then is look at the officer's actual use of force history in the field. So in real life, they pulled all of their records because you're required to report uses of force. They looked at the prior uses of force and what they found was stereotype threat actually predicted 
whether these officers had actually used force against blacks throughout the course of their career. So they were able to predict which officers, and it didn't predict uses of force against other races, but only against blacks. And they could predict that based on how concerned the officer was with appearing racist. In fact, in this study, the only form of bias that predicted racial disparities in police uses of force against blacks was stereotype threat, not conscious racism and not unconscious racial bias. Now, I'm not saying that racial prejudice or conscious bigotry is irrelevant. Of course it's relevant. And racist officers actually stopped Blacks more often. But it was stereotype threat that influenced whether deadly consequences resulted from that interaction. So you must be wondering the way I was wondering, how could this be? What explains this? So I'll, I'll tell you my thoughts on that, right? So first, officers are more likely to experience stereotype threat when interacting with Black individuals versus individuals of other racial groups. Why? Because the stereotype of police racism is likely to be more salient, more top of mind for the officer. In addition to that, when you speak to officers, and there are studies about this too, when officers believe that members of a particular community do not view them as legitimate, then officers are more likely to believe that interactions with people from that community will be more dangerous. And third, officers are trained in the academy and throughout their careers to rely on their legitimacy, or another way to think about it, is to rely on their moral authority, right? The fact that they're an officer, the fact that they're um, in uniform. They're trained to rely on that in order to control potentially dangerous situations. So if a civilian fails to respect an officer's legitimacy or moral authority, officers are trained that they are entitled to use physical force to take control of that situation. But when an officer fears that a civilian will judge them to be racist, these officers may feel unable to rely upon their moral authority or their legitimacy to control the situation. And as a result, they're quicker to believe that the situation is dangerous and then to use force as a result. So I've been talking about the impact of stereotype threat from the perspective of the officer, but you can imagine that stereotype threat can also affect those who are stereotyped as criminal. So think about young black men and boys, for instance. So for those who are concerned with appearing criminal, the mental and physical consequences of stereotype threat that I just discussed can cause these individuals, these civilians, to appear anxious or suspicious or guilt-ridden, right? Officers often uh, talk about furtive movements, right? So you could equate that with fidgeting, for instance, and lack of eye contact and speech errors. These are all uh, impacts of, of stereotype threat. And as a result, an individual, a Black individual, who is suffering from stereotype threat, worried that the officer is going to view him or her as a criminal, though their physical and mental reactions, because they're also going to have difficulty hearing the officer, right? An officer is yelling at them, because that's how officers typically uh, respond in situations like this. So they will appear criminal because officers are trained to look at certain behaviors as indicating suspicion and criminality, even when they're not. And it could just be that the individual, the civilian is also experiencing stereotype threat. And so you can imagine then an interaction with an officer experiencing stereotype threat and a civilian experiencing stereotype threat and what that interaction will look like, right? How quickly that interaction will escalate. Um, and social psychologists talk about something called the uh, behavioral confirmation effect or the self-fulfilling prophecy effect. Uh, you may have experienced this in interactions, right? If you are rubbing your nose or scratching your face, right? It, 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 often it's the case that the person you're talking to mirrors your behaviors, but you don't, you don't realize that that's what's happening, right? So you think they're just acting this way uh, and you didn't realize that you played a role in impacting the behaviors of the person you're speaking with. So you can imagine with stereotype threat, an officer and a civilian are also dealing with this self-fulfilling prophecy effects where their behaviors are affecting the behaviors of the person that they're <clears throat> interacting with. 
Okay, so that's stereotype threat. And again, stereotype threat can lead to uh, more uses of force against black versus uh, individuals of other races. And it is disconnected to conscious racial bigotry or unconscious racial bias. So that's stereotype threat, I'll return to it in a moment. Now I wanna talk about the second psychological process um, that is part of my suspicion cascades theory. And this is masculinity threat. So what is masculinity threat? And the reason I'm talking about it is it also causes racial disparities in police uses of force. So masculinity threat is the concern with being seen as insufficiently masculine. And of course, masculinity can be defined in uh, a variety of different ways. And so what I mean by masculinity threat within police departments is hyper masculinity, right? Being uh, more powerful, exerting power over others, right? Being um, very loud and aggressive, right? That, that's the type of masculinity that is often valorized uh, within police departments. So for men, because all the studies only look at um, male police officers, not female police officers. So for males who are insecure in their masculinity, the studies demonstrate that exerting power over others is used as a means to restore their sense of masculinity. And so this fear that you're not gonna fit in, that you're not masculine enough within this particular environment that you're in, that's masculinity threat. And just like stereotype threat, Masculinity threat predicts disparities, racial disparities in police use of force. So in other research using that same 3D simulation that I discussed earlier, what researchers found is that the more officers were insecure in their masculinity, the more likely they were to use force against black suspects who were non-compliant. So let me show you just the final slide that I'll share with you today. Okay. Okay, so here you see these are officers who are high in masculinity threat, those who are most concerned with not being masculine enough. And you see that if the suspects, the black suspect, the white suspect, and the Latino suspect, if they were compliant, if they followed the officer's orders, there was virtually no difference in uses of force by the officer who had masculinity threat. But when the suspects were non-compliant, and non-compliant could just be things like contempt of cop, right? Just talking back to a police officer. It doesn't have to be physical non-compliance. When the suspects were non-compliant, you can see the average number of bullets fired when it was a non-compliant black suspect versus a non-compliant white suspect and a Latino suspect. So masculinity threat, just like stereotype threat, predicts uses of force against non-compliant black suspects. And again, masculinity threat is not associated with unconscious bias or conscious bias. So why would we see this type of um, racial disparity and in, in, in uses of force? I'm sure you can think about the reasons too. Uh, one salient reason is likely because black men are stereotyped, actually so are black women. Black men and black women are stereotyped as more masculine than men of other racial groups. And therefore, they pose the greatest threat to an officer's views of his own masculinity. And again, I'm using the male pronoun because all of these studies essentially um, studied male police officers because departments still remain uh, majority male. So because black men and women are stereotyped as being more masculine, they pose a greater threat to an officer's sense of their own masculinity. And just like with stereotype threat, masculinity threat has also has real world impacts. So researchers found once again, when they looked at officers actual use of force histories, that officers who were insecure in their masculinity more frequently used force against black suspects relative to suspects of other races throughout the course of their career. 
Okay, so I've talked about stereotype threat. I've talked about masculinity threat. Let me talk about implicit or unconscious racial bias, because that's the third psychological process that makes up my theory of suspicion cascades. So I'm sure many of you know about unconscious racial bias, but just to bring um, everyone to the same place, uh, it's to understand unconscious bias, it's important to appreciate how our brains work, how we think and process information. So our minds just tend to make quick, unconscious and automatic, and by automatic, I mean we have no control over it. So our minds tend to make quick, automatic and unconscious associations in response to a stimulus. If our minds didn't do this, we simply would not be able to function with all the information that bombards us every day. So for instance, you're, I'm sure you're all sitting like I am, or most of you are, uh, when your mind sees something that looks like a chair, it's just efficient for it to call up the things that it has learned to associate with objects that look like a chair. Um, and then you know what to do with it without thinking about it at all, right? So that's how our brains work. Uh, I bet none of you thought about what this object is that you're sitting on because your brain has learned to associate this type of object with something that you sit on. Our brains do exactly the same thing about people. So if you think generally about doctors, for instance, uh, it's efficient for your mind to automatically and unconsciously call up to the forefront of your memory other related concepts like hospital all at once. And these ideas are linked in your brains, in your minds, because they're often associated with each other. And the important piece is once these associations are activated, even though that activation is unconscious and you are unaware that it's happening, they impact you. They bias you. They bias your expectations and they dis predispose you and me, all of us, to evaluate information and behaviors in accordance with the concept that was activated. So the study of unconscious racial bias then it demonstrates that our minds make these types of automatic and unconscious associations about social groups. So research over the past four decades consistently demonstrates that most of us, regardless of our race, so I'm including myself, right? I'm Korean and I'm black. Most of us, including me, automatically and unconsciously associate blacks with criminality, even if that association conflicts with our consciously and genuinely held thoughts and feelings. Once activated, however, and, and we learn these associations just from watching the news, for instance, right? Our brains just learn these associations. Once it's activated, our unconscious associations can bias our judgments and impact our behaviors towards Blacks in ways that we are unaware of and that are often, therefore, unable to control. So there's so many behavioral effects of unconscious bias, but in the interest of time, I'm just gonna share a few examples. Uh, one of the earliest studies of unconscious racial bias or unconscious anti-black bias and pro-white bias, because the two go together, um, involved a study where researchers had subjects walk into a lab and then they lied to them, right? So often uh, researchers don't tell you what the experiment is about, right? Because that would ruin the experiment. So they bring these subjects into the lab and they say to them, um, we're gonna have a task for you in a moment, but for now, why don't you watch this discussion that's being videotaped, that's happening in the next room, and we're gonna ask you some questions about it later. But there actually wasn't a discussion going on in the next room. What the subjects were watching uh, was a pre-recorded video of, of actors following a script. And in this pre-recorded video, they were always identical. You had two men who were engaged in a discussion that grew increasingly heated. And then at one point, one of the men in the video shoves the other, but that shove was ambiguous. So after the shove happened, the video was over and the researchers asked the subjects to rate that ambiguous shove. So they could rate that shove as playful and dramatic on the one hand, or as uh, violent and aggressive on the other. And the researchers manipulated the race of the individuals pictured in the video, those actors, to see how it might uh, affect the interpretation of this ambiguous shove. And it did. So when both men in the video were white, only 13% of the subjects viewed that shove 
to be violent and aggressive. But when both individuals were black in the video, the number of people went up from 13 to 69% of the subjects who viewed that identical shove as being violent and aggressive. And then they did interracial pairings. So they had a white aggressor and a black victim. So the white individual doing the shoving and the black individual was the victim. Only 17% found the white individual shove to be violent and aggressive. But when the races were switched, now the black individual was the aggressor, the white individual was the victim. The number went up from 17% to 75% of the people who viewed that identical shove as being violent, criminal, and dangerous. So the research concluded um, that it was the stereotype of blacks as being violent and criminal that influenced the subjects, the perceivers uh, interpretation of that ambiguous behavior. And so this is what I mean when we talk about bias, it's not only the negative interpretations of behaviors by blacks, but the more positive interpretation of the identical behaviors by whites. A couple other studies among conscious bias, there's something called shooter bias. Um, and this affects officers who are more likely to quote unquote see weapons in the hands of unarmed blacks than in the hands of unarmed whites and therefore to more quickly and mistakenly shoot unarmed blacks in computer simulations. So that's known as shooter bias. Uh, the final study, and like I said, there are countless studies, uh, is related to how unconscious bias can impact our behaviors. And what people have found is that unconscious racial bias, unconscious anti-Black bias, to be more specific, can cause people to act with more hostility or more aggression uh, in situations where this behavior is potentially appropriate. And again, this occurs regardless of whether people are consciously racist. Unfortunately, if an officer, because of his or her unconscious anti-Black bias, is behaving with more hostility and aggression, we already talked about the self-fulfilling prophecy effect, which means that the Black individual on the receiving end may mirror the officer's aggressive or hostile behavior, but the officer will be completely unaware of the role that his own actions played in generating the negative response with the civilian. All they will see is this unprovoked initial hostility from the negatively stereotyped group member. And of course, when this happens in the policing context, it can result in a frisk uh, or in uses of force. So these three uh, psychological processes I just discussed make up or create what I refer to as suspicion cascades. So these are waves of systematic and predictable errors in judgment that can result in significant racial disparities in police uses of force, regardless of an officer's conscious racial attitudes. And this relationship between stereotype threat, masculinity threat, and unconscious racial bias demonstrates that race plays an important, though often unconscious role in mediating or influencing our perceptions, our behaviors, and our judgments. And this knowledge then reveals why racially disparate uses of force against Blacks can occur even when officers harbor no conscious racial animosity and reject any association between blacks and criminality. So suspicion cascades reveal that an officer's feelings of suspicion and dangerousness aren't necessarily based on some objective and unambiguously suspicious behavior that they would inevitably have considered suspicious regardless of the race of the person engaged in it Instead, their evaluation of the behavior as suspicious and dangerous may be unintentionally influenced by these mental processes. Take the example, I'll just give a quick example um, of that ambiguous physical contact between two people engaged in that heated discussion. So you can imagine that because of unconscious bias, an officer observing this behavior on the street might interpret that contact as aggressive when the individuals involved are black as opposed to white, so he'll approach the black individuals, but ignore or maybe not even notice the white individuals, even though they're engaged in identical behaviors. And then because of stereotype threat and masculinity threat, any resulting interaction may lead to deadly consequences.
So this series of events demonstrates that suspicion cascades can place blacks at greater risk of violence, regardless of an officer's conscious racial attitudes. And that's why suspicion cascades demonstrate the inevitability of race affecting police interactions with blacks, even when officers consciously reject the use of race-based suspicions. So what then are the implications of all of this? As I mentioned at the beginning, I think the answer is institutional and structural, not individual. In other words, even if we were to prosecute and discipline every officer who engaged in problematic uses of force, the issue wouldn't be resolved because the problems are larger than the individual officer. Instead, we have to focus on criminal justice policies, policing strategies, police culture, and Fourth Amendment doctrine, all of which create the systems and structures that lead to stereotype threat, masculinity threat, and unconscious racial bias. So let me end by discussing what I mean. So one way uh, to avoid police racial violence is to reduce police interactions with black civilians. However, policing strategies, management practices, and Fourth Amendment doctrine create incentives for these negative interactions instead. So for instance, if you think about uh, criminal justice policies like the war on drugs and uh, broken windows and proactive policing practices, all of those things create incentives for officers to interact in negative ways with communities of color. This includes by engaging in stops and frisks, writing tickets, and arresting individuals for minor nonviolent offenses. When you couple that with the fact that top brass, so police management within police departments, top brass is often suspicious about what rank and file officers are doing in the field. So management uses other proxies to ensure that officers are actually working and not sitting in some coffee shop someplace. Uh, and these include tracking the number of tickets written, how many stops and frisks were conducted, how many field investigation cards were completed. Um, and these numbers are also used in promotion decisions. And all of these ways of measuring officer productivity increase negative interactions between Black citizens and contribute to the stereotype of police racism. Finally, all of these practices I just mentioned are facilitated by Fourth Amendment doctrine. So in theory, individuals, we all know this, right? Individuals have the right to walk away from the police as long as the police don't have the requisite suspicion. So an officer can approach you and ask you questions, but you're free to walk away as long as officers don't have either reasonable suspicion of criminal activity or probable cause to believe that you're engaged in criminal activity. However, this right is illusory especially for black and brown people. So let me explain what I mean. So you're free to walk away in theory, but if you walk away, police will tell you that they find this behavior to be suspicious and so they respond by following you, All right? So if you exercise your right to walk away, they will follow you either on foot or in their patrol car. There are some Supreme Court cases on this and what the Supreme Court said in one of them, Michigan versus Chesternut, where the officers followed an, a black individual in their patrol car for blocks. What the court said is, while it might be somewhat intimidating, a reasonable person would feel free to ignore the police presence and go about his business. Okay, so the, not only that, but the court has gone even further by permitting officers to engage in aggressive shows of force such as ordering citizens to stop, even when the officer has no reasonable suspicion or probable cause of criminal activity. And remember, in this situation, citizens have the right to avoid police contact because the suspicion doesn't exist, but the court has said officers can engage in aggressive shows of force anyway. And then if an officer, I'm sorry, if a citizen exercises their right to, or a civilian exercises their right to avoid the police by running away, the court has held that that running away, that gives rise to a reasonable suspicion of criminality, allowing officers to then chase the citizen and tackle him to the ground if they want to. But according to the court, and this is important, running from the police only gives rise to a reasonable suspicion of criminality if it takes place in a high crime neighborhood. So what's a high crime neighborhood? <laughs> 
It's typically not based on any empirical evidence that the neighborhood is actually high in crime. Instead, it's used that phrase to refer to indigent communities of color. So when you take all that together, what it means is that in the very neighborhoods where individuals have the most reason to fear the police and run away, these indigent communities of color, where they have the most reason to fear, reasons unrelated to whether or not they're engaged in criminal activity, officers can create reasonable suspicion by engaging in aggressive shows of force in order to goad citizens into running away or civilians. And even if officers are not goading people to run away, individuals in communities of color are likely to run because of their knowledge that engaging with the police can lead to their death. So this reasonable suspicion formula, this ability to create reasonable suspicion only works in indigent communities of color. And if a person runs, then officers can chase them down and use physical force to restrain them. This is problematic for a number of reasons, including the fact that officers are more likely to use force after engaging in a chase. So this entire series of events that I've just discussed is one way that suspicion cascades, policing practices, and Fourth Amendment doctrine make black and brown people more vulnerable to police violence. And all of this feeds into the belief that police are racist, beginning this entire cycle anew. So in sum, this theory of suspicion cascades reveals how systematic and predictable decision-making errors interact with policing strategies and Fourth Amendment doctrine to produce racial violence, even in the absence of conscious and unconscious racial bias. It also demonstrates why the solution is not individual, though we should, of course, punish bad officers, but punishing the bad apple is not enough. Instead, we have to focus on policing as an institution and focus on the criminal justice system in terms of systemic reform. It is necessary to completely rethink policing in order to protect communities from racial violence, which is why the social movements that have gained strength and momentum in the post-George Floyd moment in which our country is engaging in a much needed reckoning with centuries of anti-blackness and racism is so critically important right now because these movements, including Black Lives Matter, are facilitating, uh, facilitating changes in how we as a society view the police in ways that might make changes to policing seem inevitable um, and appropriate. So that's it. Thank you so much for your attention. And I'm happy to answer any questions that, that people might have. Thank you so much. That was excellent and fascinating. And we have um, several questions that have come in. So oh, great. let me lead off with this one. We have a question about whether there's a difference in the suspicion cascade theory when you move from urban to suburban to rural police departments. Oh, what a great uh, question. So most of the studies of um, the, the three psychological processes that I talked about took place in major urban environments. So I would imagine that in, in, in environments where policing was done in communities of, of, of color. So it might be likely that in um, other smaller environments, more rural environments, potentially where um, the, the community that's being policed is all white, for instance, uh, it might be that stereotype threat might not have the same impact in the way that I've described it. There might be other threats that, that police officers are, are facing or same with masculinity threat. Um, it would really depend, since masculinity threat comes from this worry about not being seen as hyper-masculine enough, uh, it would depend on who within that community is the one that triggers an officer's feelings of, of masculinity threat. Same with um, implicit bias, right? Uh, it, implicit bias exists beyond the black-white divide. There are implicit biases related to class and other things. So I've only studied the ones that I've mentioned to you, but I would imagine that's such a great question. Uh, there would be other impacts um, in, in different types of environments. The next question is, do you think that officers are emboldened to act aggressively toward those who are lawfully recording them simply because they're being recorded? And the, the person asking the question says, I'm very troubled by the recent spate of attacks against journalists, particularly those of color, including, I may not get the pronunciation incorrect, Josie Huang in LA a few days ago, and I cannot imagine why they would attack a journalist while she and others filmed them. 
Yeah, I wish I could answer that question, right? Like I, I don't, I don't have any um, better answers to that question than than you might. Um, it is, I, I guess, the one thing I would say is it it continues to shock me, although it shouldn't, that officers continue to engage this way when they know that they're being recorded, right? Like it continues to shock me. And uh, so we can think about it in different ways. Officers think they're doing exactly the right thing and they don't care that they're being recorded. They forget that they're being recorded and they're just acting the way that they normally act um, or they don't care, right? And, and because they've been able to get away with engaging in problematic policing practices for so long. So those are just three off the top of my head reasons. I'm sure they differ by the individuals involved, but it's still it still, you know, it, it still surprises me, even though I study policing and, and police violence. So the next question, for masculinity threat situations, how much of an impact does the disproportionate amount of police interactions experienced by African Americans have on the data? I know you talked a little bit about this after the question came in, but I want to make sure that this, this question is addressed for the person who asked, who asked it. Yeah, so I think it's, um, so uh, uh, with regard to masculinity threat, again, the, the studies were taking place in more um, urban environments that had a diverse uh, population. But when it comes to masculinity threat, and, and masculinity threat has been shown in a wide variety of different settings too. Um, masculinity threat predicts even domestic violence, right? Um, and so I, I think it's more related to how insecure is that officer in the environment that he is policing. And I think it's related to the police department itself, right? Because police departments themselves are very different uh, in terms of the type of culture. Like there are some police departments that have units that do not prize hypermasculinity at all, right? They prize talk and talking with members of the community and not using force. And there are some departments that have done that really well. Uh, and I would imagine in those departments, that masculinity threat itself would not be triggered in the same way because you're not valorizing a certain way of engaging in policing. So it's very situational um, related to both the individual, but more importantly, to what that culture of that particular department is like. Like that's what triggers it. There's another question and it links to what we've been talking about and then I have a follow on for this. Sure. So I'll try to throw both questions out. You talked several times that the studies are about men, but the question is how do female police officers respond to stereotypes? And my add on is are there any studies about departments that have female chiefs or larger proportions of, of women? Does that oh, play interesting. in at all? Interesting with the female chief question. Uh, so women and, and females tend to be, again, like I said before, there's not that many um, women. And so, and the few studies that exist demonstrate a few different things that I'll, that I'll mention. Um, if you are in a department, I'm speaking very broadly now, not one particular study, but m mashing them all together. If you don't have a cohort of female officers, the situation in which you find yourself will impact your behavior, right? So we all, all want to be successful in whatever group we happen to be in. So as a woman, if I were a member of a police department, for instance, I might engage with people in the identical ways as my male colleagues, because I want to show that I can be a good officer too, right? That I can fit in too. So we see that with females in police departments. It's not necessarily the case that females are better, but there is a body of evidence that we are right, that we talk more because it's just the way that we engage in day-to-day -day life, right? We, we are more communicative um, than, than men are. And that is also shown in police departments. So we engage in fewer uses of force because we're more willing to engage with people and speak with people and not react with force or with a gun as quickly as some male officers are. So it is definitely true uh, that with the studies that exist, there's socialization of, um, of females on the one hand and ostracization, uh, ostr female officers are ostracized more within departments. But there is also evidence that having more diversity, having more females in police departments could actually reduce the uses of force that exist. So there are some, 
studies that demonstrate that. With female police chiefs, that's such an interesting question. Like, I don't know, right, of, of any study. So I, I could speculate about it. I could imagine it going in both directions, right? I, 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 I definitely could, being you and I, <laughs> right? Do we do things differently as female leaders than male leaders do? I actually think about this a lot, and, and I think it's probably the same. So one thing that, that I was thinking about is how is this data being used? If these threats can predict actual violence in the field, are police departments yep. using it in hiring and in partnering? And a related question is, does this validate the calls to bring social workers into the process and either partner social workers with the police in some incidents or, or defund, if you will, to give social workers and other types of professionals the ability to respond in yep. different situations. So I, I think it does with regard to the latter piece, right? Because when I worked with police officers, many, um, especially management, but also rank and file, what they will say is, look at all the things that we have been tasked with doing. We have put too much responsibility on police. I mean, even if we, we, us on this call were asked to be able to do all the things that we require our police to do, we couldn't do it, right? Not only have, do you have to be great at your ability to know and how and when to use force, but you also then have to switch on a dime, become a mental health expert at the same time, right? And then everything in between. Uh, that is a problem of our society, right? We have, it's been so easy to just say, let's just call the police and have them deal with all of our societal problems. And I think that instinct has to change. And I think that's the power of the movement that we're seeing right now. Let's take some of these things away from police as their responsibility. And let's think and rethink what the role is of police in our society in the first place. We, we have not thought through that a lot. You're, or enough. Uh, your second question was about hiring. Um, and, and that is complicated because for me, the stereotype threat and masculinity threat are not about hiring and who should come in, but about changing policing. So with masculinity threat, if we didn't valorize a certain type of hyper-masculine policing, we wouldn't have to worry about masculinity threat. With stereotype threat, the reason I would say we don't hire based on that is because that racist officer is the one who was low in stereotype threat, and the, the great officer, the one that we might think about as wanting as a police officer, was terrible. Um, and so my question is, where does that stereotype arise from? And that arises from Fourth Amendment doctrine, policing practices, broken windows police, right? So we need to deal with those bigger systemic issues so that stereotype threat and masculinity threat don't impact the way police do their jobs. That, that's the way I think about it. Great, thanks. Uh, next question. How much does the us versus them, AKA thin blue line mentality link to the issue of masculinity threat? Very recently, there have been police unions that have made speeches where they portray themselves through a victimhood mentality. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I love that question. And um, I'm not sure how much of a role it might play in masculinity threat, but it certainly plays into that other psychological process that we all know about, which is we distinguish ourselves and really like people who we view as like us and, and view people who we don't view as like us as being negative in every possible way. And so when the police define their group as us, law enforcement, and you, the community, you are already creating a situation that is more likely to lead to negative interactions versus a situation where you say, we are part of the community. Right, we are we are like you. We we are together in this, right? And and viewing the police and communities as being partners. If you believe police departments should exist, I know that there are people who don't. But if you do, viewing people within the communities as part of this joint endeavor to do whatever it is that we decide law enforcement should do, that would create very different interactions. Right, but so often it is that us and them, you over there and us over here, and that already is going to create a lot of the negative interactions and violence that we see. And the final question we have is, 
would the perception of black people being more masculine be the black brute stereotype? The, the black brute, yeah, or implicit dehumanization too, right? So these are all the, um, like I said, I didn't have much time to go deep into unconscious racial bias and all the studies we have. So let me just share just a few. Um, people, civilians and police, the connection between crime and blackness is so connected that what Jennifer Eberhard and other researchers have found is simply thinking about crime makes you think unconsciously about black people and then the result is you end up paying more attention to people who are black, who are present in the environment, right? That is an example of the black criminality stereotype. And you could view it as the, in the opposite way of the white innocence stereotype. It is difficult for our minds to link white people with criminality. So we pay attention to black people, when we think about crime and we basically ignore white people when we think about crime, this is one of those examples of the black crime stereotype. And we learn it just from watching the local news or watching the protests across the country, right? Like if you focus and you hear people talking about what I'm doing right now, talking about the association between blacks and crime, your brain is just taking in the information. It's not making any judgments about it. It is just seeing that the two are being associated with each other, strengthening the unconscious association, right? That's how pernicious this is. That's why the answers to this question, these questions are, we need to think big, right? We have individual level things that we should be doing, but we also need to think institutionally and systemically because it's, that's what causes the unconscious biases that we have that then impact our behaviors in problematic ways. Well, thank you so much for being with us this evening to discuss these very important topics. This has been fantastic. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. It's been, it's been great to think about something else <laughs> for an hour. Everyone, thanks for joining us. Have an excellent evening. Take care. Bye.